Okay, testing, one, two. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the 30-something podcast. Today's guest is Annie Tevlin, who is the founder of Skin Owl, a brand that aims to address whole skin health. We're going to talk beauty. We're going to talk skincare. And we're going to talk motherhood because Annie is incredibly charming and hysterical. And her podcast, Off the Record, is so much more than just self-care and beauty. So I cannot wait for you to listen. Let's hope I've done this Zoom recording right. <laughs> and we'll see you in a sec. Okay. So this is the YouTube recording. Hi guys. Welcome to 30 something with Sunny. I have Annie Tevlin on today, who is the founder of Skin Owl. We were chatting before and I was like, Annie, I have to stop and pause you because we need to get this on. Um, I, I want to get to obviously all of the Skin Owl and the and the beauty stuff and the self-care. But Annie, I love you for all that you do in the motherhood space too. I feel like um, after I heard your episode where you talked about getting your first period after having a baby, I was like, she's my people. <laughs> dark days, dark dark days. Dark, dark days, my friend. They come back with the vengeance. Um, you have a beautiful little baby, Monty. How old is he now? Oh my God, he's going to be nine months in, on the 24th, so five days. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, you just blend it all so beautifully. And I really want to like dive into all of the above motherhood and beauty. I really focus on those two, but, um, you and I were just talking before this started, you're in LA right now, but thinking about not being in LA, can you bring us up to speed yes. on to where you might be heading? Absolutely. I think, you know, I've been in Los Angeles. I graduated from college in 2003 and two weeks later I was on a flight to LA and I have been here ever since, you know, I've, I've spent, almost the exact amount of time that I lived under my parents' roof, you know, all throughout high school and so on in Los Angeles. And so it's been a lifetime. I have worn so many different hats. I have, the, the wonderful thing about Los Angeles is that if you are down to recreate yourself and start, you know, go into another career and, and, and try another adventure, like Los Angeles is down uh, for that. Um, I feel very grateful to have been here for as long as I have, um, to work in the entertainment industry, to work in fashion, to work in sales. And obviously now as an entrepreneur, um, with concern to owning a skincare company. Um, but I think now that I am, you know, in a happy relationship, I was married before also in this town. Um, you know, I'm in a happy marriage. I have a nine month old. Uh, and when you really feel like you have found your footing and you are settled and happy, you know, for me, I'm just not sure I need the backdrop of Los Angeles. And I think part of me maybe moved here to, you know, to, to, to leave a mark and to do something special and to go to the city of angels and dreamers and, and create something from the ground up. But really what it comes down to is I think there was also a part of me that hid behind the cloak of Los Angeles, that life isn't all that boring from the outside looking in if you live in LA. <clears throat> and, you know, as someone who struggled with self-worth and um, just trying to find my independent voice, I think Los Angeles is a wonderful place to kind of um, act as your facade. And now that there's so much authentic joy in my life, the whole world is open up to me. You know, it really has. It's like, if really all you do is care for your child and go to wine bars and eat frozen yogurt and like go for walks around your town, it's like, can we do that in a place that's less expensive, less chaotic and more meaningful somewhere else? And so um, before the pandemic hit, my husband and I were supposed to move to Vancouver for six weeks, um, Canada, and just explore a very natural setting, a place with friendly people, a place that had its own bustling metropolis, so to speak. Um, and, and now obviously the Canadian US border is shut down, so we're not able to do that. But um, it, it, on Friday, we're gonna drive to Boise with our 100 pound dog and our nine month old. And we are going to go explore. And I don't know if you've heard anything about this, but like Boise is just, it's just everywhere right now. It's like Forbes and on Instagram and people that I follow and, you know, very much look up to are moving to Idaho, which I've never thought that I would ever consider. But now it's like, it is so flipping cool. Like I can't even take it. Like I hope that when we go there, it's everything that we think it's going to be and, and more. It's funny. I, th I think like, as you get older, you really hit the nail on the head with, um, you know, reaching a point where you have found what you were looking for inside and with your people and with your group. And I think that's a 
valuable lesson for a lot of people because as women, we tend to look for validation and definitions of success like outside of ourselves. But I love hearing that you you found that with all that you need, your health, your people, and and that's it. Yeah. And it, it does yeah. cut down on, you know, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I've never lived in LA, but I can understand wanting to kind of pull back from a crazier scene and really find yourself. My husband and I joke that Montana is our next like big move. And if you know you're getting old when your dream is to like have no neighbors. I'm like, if I get Amazon Prime there, I'm good. That's all I need. I mean, that's it. You know? It's My so kid- true. Yeah, it really it's is. so true. And I think like, you know, living, I don't know if I fully agree with all of the kind of edit, editorial commentary about like the cities have lost their shine because, you know, like you, you hear about people in New York, it's like, what is Manhattan and what is living in New York? If like during a pandemic, you're just kind of living in a box and not able to take advantage of all that New York has to offer um, and, and all of that culture and, and art and restaurants and nightlife. Like, Los Angeles is different because we get the parks, we get the sunshine, you can go to the beach. Like I think quarantine here, it's very, it's very divisive. Like depending on where you live in the world, your experience safer at home is different. And I think being at home so much, it's allowed us to really lean into that, that slowness. And while it definitely hasn't been the great pause for us, we've been hustling. I've been trying to keep a business sustained. I've been trying, you know, to be a new mom and and acclimate uh, in, in the best way I know how, but it has definitely leaned down the complexity. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, we wouldn't know if we were in the middle of Boise right now or Los Angeles, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like we, it's not like I'm in the club scene doing right. all the things that LA, I'm not working in the entertainment industry anymore. Like I wouldn't know if I was in, in Los Angeles or not. So it's like, why not retreat to a place that might be a better place for Monty to grow up or a better, you know, a less chaotic place. Um, I'm starting to see myself change a little bit uh, as a result of that chaos, you know, less, uh, more easily frustrated and less, um, you know, patience. It's like, that's not who I am, Mm -hmm. but that's what I feel like this city sometimes brings out. Mm -hmm. And so what if we dialed down and retreated to a place that's lush and natural and, you know, there's kindness and neighbors that like invite you over. I mean, all of this stuff that I was raised with, it's like, that is so desirable now. Where are you from originally? Uh, Northern Virginia, right outside oh. of Washington, DC. Very cool. Okay. So you yeah. really did make a move. You moved, uh, I mean, time zones, other end of the country, different culture, everything. I mean, that's, absolutely. yeah. I- I'm curious if when you, I mean, obviously you'll continue to run your business from wherever you are, but do you imagine that'll impact Skin Owl and all that you've built up? Because as you mentioned, you have a lot of connections and kind of your, your business baby was born in LA. So you'll obviously keep the structure you have, but kind of move headquarters, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Skin Owl has really grown up uh, over the last year. Like if Skin Owl was a college kid, um, you know, it's now living very independent of even its own employees you know I think right now what I have been able to and my team has been able to structure during this time is um, working remotely and so because of the internet you know we're all connected I'm not sure I need to be in Los Angeles anymore and I don't know what the event space is going to look like or the trade show you know like I don't know what this industry is going to look like Um, I know that I'm thriving by way of insta lives and um you know virtual conferences on zoom and while that will never ever ever take the place of life and connection in in real life and and i i stand firmly in that i don't think it should and i think that would be a a major loss to not only business but us as humans i do think that there's an opportunity to be at a distance let people be their own boss Um, my team is really good at that they are very independent they are very efficient they are very you know, they're self-starters. Um, they're very meticulous. Um, it's a lean team, but a strong team. And I think, you know, I've been talking about this for a while. Like, I just don't know, guys, if I'm going to be here anymore. And I think, like, my team is kind of like, yeah, you know, we're just, is it Vancouver? Is it Boise? Like, just, pick, you know, just figure yeah. out where you're going. Um, and then we'll figure it out. And I think I, you know, I have a house here. I don't know if we'll sell our home right away. Is, it, is there an opportunity for me to be somewhere else, but come back to LA every so often? Like, I think that we're all all entrepreneurs right now, and especially like with now I've invested in my own podcast equipment, like I'm no longer 
recording my podcast in a studio. So I can be mobile anywhere with that too, which is a cool sense of freedom. So I think as an entrepreneur, we're just figuring it out as we go. And if it's possible and your team can stay happy um, and not feel like really isolated at home while they're working, I think there's room to really grow something new. And I'm mm -hmm. excited, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see where this can all go. You have a background, you said, in the entertainment industry. You now have your own business. You have your own podcast. I'm curious, um, based on what you've experienced and how you just said the workflows changed as a result of this quarantine, if you think that this, that space in particular, the podcast world, the online world, has opened up to people sort of outside the two coasts now that we know we don't have to be in a zone. Because I'm speaking as someone who has never, I mean, I lived for a short time in New York, but um, who has never lived in one of the big cities, but has always struggled as a content creator as a creative to remain relevant in a space that really doesn't recognize you unless you are from one of those cities. So I'm curious, do you think this will open up the doors for people to see work as legitimate, even though it's not coming geographically from certain places or certain people located in certain places? I mean, absolutely. I think you're seeing, first of all, you're seeing historical city dwellers relocate to yeah. places like Montana. You know, some of the the heaviest hitters that I know in Los Angeles have already moved to Boise, have already moved to Seattle, you know, have moved to other places. And at the end of the day, you know, the, 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 the cities are inundated. The cities, I think there's just, just there's not a lot of room to grow. There's, mm -hmm. there's people that are in there and are creating growth. But in terms of landscape, I mean, you look at Microsoft and Amazon, I mean, they're, they've moved into Seattle. They're going into places like Arlington, Virginia. They're going, um, Silicon Valley. I mean, there, wherever you are, you are. You know, there, mm -hmm. there's going to be opportunity for people in places like Portland and people um, in Raleigh and Charleston. I mean, these towns that are are bustling because people want a better quality of life or mm -hmm. to be able to afford life or don't have to send their kids to private school in order to have a good education. Like they, these places, it's. I give it two years. I give, I literally give it two years and we're all connected, you know, and, and people living in Raleigh want the boutiques that people are shopping in in LA and mm -hmm. they want to have Orange Theory and they want to have Pure Bar and they want to have that cool coffee shop. And then people with money or people who are able to open up that franchise are moving those places mm -hmm. there. And so it's, I think we're all just getting more connected because the places that we all want are popping up. Yeah, I love it. I, I it's it's the great democratization. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I you know, it's it's really cool to see. I want to circle back. I, I initially was really attracted to. I mean, I've known about Scanel. I'm a product whore in the truest sense. So I have <laughs> seen you got you know, like uh, I bounce back and forth between forums. I'm like all up on who loves what. And I was reading up on your backstory even before we were connected in this space. And what really moved me about your product line is the story behind it. I personally suffered from horrible acne in my early 20s while I was working in television, which is just a double slap in the face. I was sitting in an, I remember sitting in an editorial meeting one day and like it was a full lit room and I just like doing one of these. I was oh, yeah. so psychologically impacted by bad skin. I know that you have a personal story as to how you fell in love with the beauty industry and why you created the products you did. So can you tell us some of your backstory in that regard. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a bit layered. I think it, it, when I was a kid, I gravitated towards color uh, mm. in general. Like I loved the rainbow and I loved crayons and I loved, you know, my mom would go shopping at Nordstrom or Bloomingdale's or wherever and I would just run off into the makeup department and just <laughs> play with blush. And I just loved color and I loved, um, I, I was always very, connected to humans and people and talking to people and I would study their faces. And so it, it doesn't surprise me that I, I took a vested interest in makeup. My grandmother, uh, my paternal grandmother was very much into Paris and fashion and she was from Scotland and, and had that European, you know, je ne sais quoi, so to speak. And I think I just, I took after her in that way, um, uh, just finding such a such beauty in um, beautifying yourself um, and taking care of yourself. And so, you know, I loved that. I think 
there was a little bit of a, a clash because I was a swimmer the majority of my life. So I never really got to wear makeup. And like, I wasn't really, I think my parents were a little bit more traditional in the sense of like, you know, maybe don't like wear all the makeup that all the other girls are wearing. And so I, you know, I didn't really get to experience that until I was uh, a young adult. I, I got headhunted by Lancome. Um, and I was a makeup artist for them, traveling around for a while. I was doing makeup artistry. I moved to LA to be a music video director because I was obsessed with music videos. At the That's time. cool. Oh my gosh, what videos did you work on? Just pause for a second. I have to hear this. this is I insane. mean, it's I haven't talked about this in so long, like the videos. But I worked on, I mean, I worked on Britney Spears. I worked on In Sync. I Stop. I worked for. A Give, lot. Okay, yeah. wait. Did did you get any good scoop you can share with us? Because there's like a statute of limitations on gossip. So if it's old, <laughs> it's not really spilling the tea because it's old. Like what I is mean, Brittany really like, for example? Brittany, so I I interned for Quentin Tarantino's production company the summer after my junior year in college. And he had a music video company that was called A Band Apart, which has since closed. And if you were you know, born in the 80s, you might remember on MTV, a show called Making of the Video. Yes. And, and that I watched an episode with a director, his name is Wayne Isham, and he directed the pop video by NSYNC. And I, I remember watching that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I being a junior, no, I was a sophomore in college and watching that show and being like, that's what I'm going to do with my life. It's like, you see, you know, we all have that. Like some people want to be a doctor. Some people are like, I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. Like, I was like, I love music so much and I don't have the chops to be the musician, but I have the chops to see the vision mm -hmm. and I can tell a story so well. And so I'm going to be a music video director. And I literally, I, I spent the second half of my junior year living in London. I came back from studying abroad. I was like, there's no way I can live back in Virginia. I'm going to move to LA. And I'm going to see if somebody will hire me to be an intern at a music production company. And my parents were super supportive. And they were like, sure. I found two kids uh, that I was friends with in college who wanted to do the same thing. So we all got out in Los Angeles and all had our different jobs in production. And I worked on Polina Rubio, uh, you know, Jack, Jack White, the White Stripes. I mean, I, I was in the... Of them. And Britney was, you know, this was like pre Britney, I think, having a little bit of an episode. And it was around the time of Slave and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, Stronger and, and a lot of the, the stuff that really made a name for herself. And she was lovely, you know, she was such a sweet, young Southern girl. Um, who had a little bit of an edge to her. I mean, you could see it, you know, you, you could see that that part was wanting to come out. Um, and it was just at the, at, the, at the apex of the pop industry being That's what so it cool. was. That's you know, so Mandy cool. Moore, I worked on a Mandy Moore video before she was on This Is Us. Um, and I, I was a production assistant. I was a production coordinator. I started shadowing makeup artists. I mean, I worked, I worked for DreamWorks. I worked at a pre-Oscar show with, with Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. And it was the year that Jennifer Hudson won for um, Dream Girls. I mean, it was like, it was a time. It was a time in my life and I'll be able to tell my son about it one day. Like I did everything that I set out to do in Los Angeles and worked with everybody, honestly, that I wanted to work with. And then that industry fell apart because of copyright and piracy and you know what eventually became no longer a, a record label being able to have the money to afford to make music videos and so I feel so blessed to have been at the end of such a wonderful um, industry and it taught me a lot it taught me a lot about makeup and it taught me a lot about beauty and and just how to enhance people's features and um and, you know, unfortunately, that kind of led, I mean, uh, unfortunately, it led to me having acne because I was wearing so much makeup day in and day out, you know, keeping up appearances and so on. But it was with really shitty ingredient decks and really icky ingredients that were toxic. And, you know, all of a sudden, like that, I got hit with cystic acne. And it was, um, you know, as you said, it's the first thing people see. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it, 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 it lent itself to a major deficit of self-worth that touched in, I mean, it hit everything. It hit, yes. 
you know, I didn't think I was worthy of dating that guy. I didn't think that I was worthy of applying for that job. I didn't think that I could dress like this because then that would attract attention to my face. And, you know, it was, it changed who I was as a person. And it wasn't anything that I thought I would get. And it wasn't anything I knew how to go up against because everything that was, um, you know, marketed to me in terms of skincare would work for like two weeks and then would stop working. And it really was just a battle of how much makeup I can wear to cover it. Um, and thank God I was a makeup artist and I knew how to do it. I can't imagine if I was just like, you know, someone who didn't have that expertise and then was, you know, self-conscious because of how cakey it would look and so on and so on. So it was, you know, it was a never ending cycle of just wanting to get ahead of that. And mm -hmm. I finally had to take matters into my own hands and, um, and this kind of goes into a different direction, but I, I went back to school yeah. and I studied cosmetic chemistry at UCLA. They had a graduate certificate program and I went through the program three times and my professor was a genius and taught me everything there was to learn about what really heals acne versus what is marketed to us as healing acne and started formulating things in my kitchen. And um, I had a Facebook group at the time that was called Skin Owl. And I was like the messenger of wisdom in a very confusing industry based on all of the information I had gained from learning about cosmetic chemistry and then being a makeup artist. Like I knew every product on the scene. I could recommend anything. I was mm -hmm. like your at home beauty consultant. Um, and people, the group grew from like six people, like my friends and my mom's friends to like 1600 people. And I was answering copious amounts of questions, helping everybody with their skin. And then I finally was like, you know what? I think I know how to make a product. And I made a product and I started using it and I got rid of my acne in 32 days. That's <laughs> and insane. Then people, yeah. People were like, what? did you use? And I'm like, well, this is a little awkward. It's not something from Sephora. It's actually something I made. And honestly, that was the beginning of Skin Owl, the product line. I shared my before and after photos and 1600 people in the group were like, I cannot believe that you did that. I need it for my daughter. I need it for myself. Yep. I need it for my son. And um, the before and afters of people that started using the product was unbelievable. It's now what is now the geranium drops. Um, that it's the same formulation it was seven years ago. It hasn't changed. Um, it has helped people so much with cystic acne. I can't even begin to tell you the product sells itself. And, you know, that was seven years ago and now it's a full fledged, you know, skincare line. What's the ingredient, the active ingredient in there that gets in there and fixes things? It is our unique strain of cold pressed unrefined argan oil and the most pure decongesting uh, strain of geranium essential organic or geranium essential oil that I've ever tried. And it's such a unique product because people have this, I've tried argan oil, mm -hmm. whatever. I've tried products with geranium in it. You, if the simplicity of how those two dance together and what they can do when you isolate those ingredients, specifically the strains that we use, because I've tried a lot of argan oil and I don't have the best things to always say about it, but mm -hmm this is just such a unique dance of two ingredients. What, what was the biggest, so um, I guess, complaint or question you would get from people in your community? Because what's awesome is that you built this, uh, this, this company based on community from the beginning. So you really have had an ear to the ground when it comes to what people are needing. And also what's a big skin myth that you want to bust? Because um, I'm sure there are people out there who are wondering why their products aren't working. So the concerns you get, the complaints and, and one of the myths or a couple myths that you want to dispel. Yeah, I think it's a couple things. I think number one, like I have acne and I feel like I should know how to get rid of it. And that's just not the case because when it comes to acne, you're dealing with a lot of different things. You're not just dealing with using bad skincare or using bad makeup or, you know, because you're not on Accutane, like you're doing something wrong. I mean, this is, it's a hormonal conversation and hormones are the great manipulator. Um, you do not know how to chase them. They're game of Pac-Man and for you to <laughs> feel bad because you're not able to go up against something like a hormone cascade is like being able to go up against, you know, anything that is manipulating. It is, um, it is just an ebb and flow that uh, you just sometimes have to let time heal 
uh, to be honest. Um, you know, when you're incorporating pregnancy or birth control or um, adrenal glands or anything that have been kind of shot along the way, nervous system. I mean, the hormones are the great equalizer in all of those scenarios. And so, you know, I think just the one myth I would say, and I have two, but one would be like that you should know what to do about your acne and you can eat all the right foods and get rid of sugar and get rid of gluten and get rid of this and drink more water and you might still have acne. And it's, it is the great game of, of testing your patients because you have to endure acne sometimes before it's going to go away. And what that time will present and, and show you in terms of finding other ways to value yourself other than your looks is so important and maybe could be the silver lining. Um, the other thing is that I think with concern to product, most people who have acne think that it's just a game of face off. Like if there is a product out there that says brightening or resurfacing or exfoliating, someone with acne is running towards it. And I don't know what it is about those of us with cystic acne that when we see a product like brightening and resurfacing and, and you know, restorative or, um, you know, anything with clarifying or purifying, it's like we, with acne, we want to take our face off. We want to mm -hmm. use all the peels. We want to use all the salicylic acid and we want to use it in every single product. We want the salicylic cleanser with the benzoyl peroxide and then the tetracycline and then you know, the AHAs and the glycolic. And what happens is, is you are creating such trauma to your skin and such rap, you know, rampant exfoliation that you never get to balance your pH. You never really get to create dead skin cells that can grow back and heal your skin. And that's where Skin Owl comes in. It's a very healing line. It's a very nur nurturing line. And it goes up against everything that we're taught, ac um, you know, acne products should do, which is strip. Yeah. And I wish that I had known that sooner because um, that's where I was at that time. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I'm a person who went on Accutane, uh, much to my own disappointment in retrospect, because I'm like, wow, that stuff. I believed in, I, you know, I believe you do what works for you. I did it. It worked for me until it didn't. And the only thing that healed me full time is exactly what you said, a consistent skincare routine. And ironically, it took me getting out of the um, American uh, product availability. I had to go to a Hungarian facialist. They're trained differently. They're using different products. And she said what you said to me, which blew my mind, which is yep. you're stripping your skin, you're creating more dead skin, which is trapping it, like just be gentle. And it was a, a true, like a moment of transfer transformation for me. And ever since then, I, I've been telling friends who I'm not an expert, but I, I just keep saying, you know, be careful not to do too much. And I think yep. that's like you said, we see that word um, clarifying or we think, okay, new start. I'm going to get new skin and it's going to be great. And then yes. making it worse. So I'd love to hear well, that. You, because... you, you know, nailed it in saying like, what will do it is a consistent skincare routine and is using glycolic and AHA and salicylic and exfoliators, granule exfoliators, uh, you know, uh, consistent for someone with acne? No, mm -hmm. you do that for about two weeks. You're going to have red skin. You're going to have flaky skin. You're going to, so it is about creating a consistent skincare routine. You know, those types of things, while there's a place for exfoliation with acne and there's a place for, um, you know, uh, resurfacing and that kind of stuff. It's like, it's, you, you can't have surface acne. You can't have red inflamed skin. You're going to, use a granule a scrub on open acne. Not only are you going to spread the bacteria, but you're going to increase your chances of scarring. You know, there's, it's, it's, it's enzymatic, right? It's fruit enzymes maybe with acne or it's, um, you know, it's oatmeal. It's something that's like a little bit more gentle. Uh, it's not take your face off. And I think right. that we're so angry with our skin that sometimes we use the most fiery of products. That's There's really some, true. a psychological connection there. I think you're right. Like scrub it off and start again. Um, do you believe in beauty tools? Because we've seen a huge market explode. And which ones do you think are worth the money? Because I am noticing some, a lot of them tend to, tend to be really expensive. So I, I know people ask, okay, if I'm going to buy a beauty tool, which one and how much like should it be costing me? Yes. I mean, I am, well, I'll say this. I first was like, I don't, I, okay. That seems like an indulgent ritual that people are doing just for, I don't even know. It's, it just seemed, it seemed fluffy 
at first and then I educated myself and now skin owl has two. Mm -hmm. I saw (laughs) that. Yeah. Yeah. Which was why I was curious, but they're simple tools that you have, right? Nothing that's going to take up too much time. Absolutely. I think one is, one's a face tool, one's a face and body tool. We have the wand, which is um, a howlite uh, kind of like torpedo looking wand. And it has a bulbous side that you can use on bigger, you know, areas of real estate on the face. And it has a more um, uh, narrow side to go under the eye to help with pressure points. You use it light kind of lymph uh, style massage on the face. You're going to see a complete difference in one side of your face you weren't to do it on the other. It is the proof is in the pudding. I tell people do it for 30 seconds, you know, slide from the cheek and the nostril and the inside of your eye and the middle of your forehead out to the temple, out to your ear, down the neck and watch what happens. It's going to help with draining dead, you know, dead toxic bacteria, de- uh, contouring, depuffing, boosting collagen. It's incredible. You take, you know, if you had two twin sisters or brothers and one used a tool and one didn't, the one who used the tool every single day uh, would look younger in 20 years. Um, is that because it's helping to like get rid of, the, I hate the word toxins because I don't know really what it is, but is it because it's draining something? Yes. What's yes. it getting it's rid of and like some... what's it moving around in there? Yeah. I mean, not only is it a, is a circulation tool, mm-hmm. so you're allowing more blood to pool in your face and where there's blood, there's healing. Sometimes where there's blood, there's also trauma and inflammation. But if you're using a light kind of lymph touch, something that's more, you know, softer, uh, lymph massage should be soft because the lymph lives very close to the surface of the skin versus like a deep tissue that's going to be more muscular. You want to drive lymph out of the body in a very soft touch towards the armpit, towards the groin. Mm -hmm. You get rid of the dead bacteria that lives in lymph. It's an immunity tool. You know, mm-hmm. it is something that's going to make your skin look brighter. It's going to boost collagen. It's going to get rid of um, the water retention. You know, bone structure comes out uh, with our other tool. It's called the glow stick. That's more of a semiconductor. So it's just something, and I usually have them on me. It's just something that you would like wiggle and mm-hmm. roll. It actually spins and there's germanium stones on it, which act as a semiconductor to emit negative electrons to boost positive ions in the body and you know as we get older and we deal with stress and environmental aggressors our positive ions decrease in the same way that cellular renewal slows down as we age and this is almost kind of like a like a jolt to the system and 30 seconds with the glow stick and you have contoured uh you know plump kind of smooth uh you know if you don't have a lot of circulation or that like nice rosy cheek is fantastic for that um you can use it on the body you can use it post-workout it's going to tighten and lift um it just you don't need to do it for a long time i think normally you see people slowly using it and it's kind of like do this for 30 minutes Uh, three minutes three minutes do it when you wake up and then do it before bed and watch what happens over the course of a week. And are we using product under it, like an oil to help it glide, or can you do it on bare skin? Yeah, I think with the tools that are more your crystals and your gems and your rocks, you should use it with product Mm -hmm. um, just so that you get a nice slip. With the glow stick, I would recommend actually without, I mean, you can use it like once product is applied, but you don't need to actually put it on the tool and use it that way. I would would let the germanium stones do the work um, with the glow stick and and just watch what happens like it's 30 seconds i mean 30 seconds honestly 30 seconds and it is like i love it's almost like a magic show when i have a when back in the day when i used to have events and i used to be able to touch people um i would put it on people's face and like i would just be like i'm just gonna do half one side and it was crazy really? what it did for people who were fatigued who held on to a lot of lymph under their eye or around their lips or on their jaw I mean, it was, it's bananas. Like it is. Do a quick, like, um, we're doing YouTube video guys. So if you're listening on the podcast, um, make sure you go check out my YouTube channel because you can actually see us. Can I grab it real fast? Oh yeah. Yeah. Go, go, go ahead. Okay. Hold on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Music to play. <laughs> intermission, musical intermission. Yeah. So guys, if you're listening to the podcast, pop over to my YouTube channel. I wanted Annie to show us some motions of how to use these, um, tools so that if you're investing in them, you can know exactly what to do. So. Okay, here we go. We've got it. We've got it. Okay, I got both. So this is the beauty wand. Okay. 
and this is the glow stick. And that one is made, the beauty one is made of what? So this is how light. Um, this is like a two-sided wand. Um, it's not porous, so you can literally like scoop product off of your hand or put product, mm. you know, directly onto the wand. And then I can kind of show you here. Can you yeah, get a good me. glimpse yeah. of my face? We can see you great. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So I'll show you one side with the beauty wand, and then I'll show you the other side with the glow stick. Oh, so I this. actually okay. have on a little bit of skincare. You're going to take the more bulbous side. I'm just going to do my under eye. Let me see if I can get like some proper light here. Okay. This is in the neck afterwards so that the dead bacteria living in your lymph and the toxins can go out the armpit. I tell people a lot of times you might smell a little bit of like an odor or perspiration. That's completely normal. Um, your urine might have a little bit of a scent, and that's just the dead bacteria living in the lymph. Oh, that looks so relaxing right now. <gasps> it is. And like, I think like when you see someone doing this, it's like, that's not a scrub. That's not a peel. That's not laser. Like what? That just seems like something that that's like a nap and it's not. It's so if you're doing like at nighttime, because I feel like I would see myself using like something like this at night so I can relax before bed, especially, would you wash your face, tone, and then like put an oil? And what if you use like a retinol or treatment product, where would that fall in the routine? So I would do this um, on the opposite time that you would use your retinol because you don't okay. want to travel your retinol. I would cleanse the face. I would, you know, for me, I, I use our charcoal bar. I use our our lemon do, which is our mist. I then put on one of my drops. I use the geranium drops, or I'll use like the maki berry whip, and that gives me a nice slip. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just I would recommend in general, just because of the photo uh, sensitivity of it. So I don't know if you can see. Oh my gosh! I swear I can. I swear to you, I can. So you can see the brow here. And, and here in particular, yeah. Yeah, you have more, you know, when people age, it's because this area starts to atrophy. And huh. when you open this up and get rid of all the dead lymph or the dead bacteria living in the lymph here, you now have, I mean, that's the difference between youth. And then when you're like, I don't, when you see a picture of yourself like two years ago and you're like, why do I look younger? It was just two years ago. And it's because this real estate starts to shrink. And so then you look at the jawline, you look here, I finally have contour where this is more puffy. That's this brow insane. is lifted. It's incredible. I've like never seen an instant in. result like that. It's amazing. What, we did it for like, four, I don't know, 45 seconds. Wow. I'm sold. That's amazing. And it amazing. can live for like up to three hours. That's a better look. That's I mean, crazy. This is like a totally different eye. It almost looks like more awake exactly what it is because you're driving and you're brightening um this is better this is better lighting so now i'm going to go in with the glow stick you guys see that this has germanium this has 30 encrusted germanium stones on it um i i mean it spins like you can mm -hmm. kind of see it spins mm -hmm. so i just go in and i just wiggle this down the neck this tool is so insanely amazing you can use it on the waist you can use it on the stomach you can use it below you know under the arms if you like a little tonage there um, along the side of the nose is really powerful because if anybody has like a deviated septum or any kind of sinus tract issue or allergy getting rid of the dead bacteria that lives around the nostril age and fatigue live in the nose i always tell people that that puffiness that fatigue I'll show you when I'm done here the difference between um, one nostril and the other and tell me how much more youthful the face looks. You guys, this, this is insane. Oh my gosh. I really, and I have, I have a tool similar to that in my arsenal and I was using it for a while and then I just kind of like stopped because I'm like, eh. but this is like really, really convincing me that I need to like get on this routine. It's amazing. Yes. Oh my gosh. And even like you said, like, look here, at my nose. Yes. Oh my God, Annie, stop it. This is insane. It's insane. So that was 30 seconds. I tell people to do it with the glow stick and just like, just like massage it along the side. I can feel it. I can, it's like almost like a pressure point. I, I'm obsessed with doing it on the side of the nose because mm -hmm. you feel 
you feel that release and i have a deviated septum so it's like i have horrible I sinuses breathe. yeah oh my gosh crazy town okay brow. i love it this is insane. I feel like if this is, there's one thing, because I have a lot of beauty junkies who listen that people need to take from this is like, you need to invest in a tool. So you just okay. get one tool, you know, just get one tool, use it and watch, just try it. You know, it, this is now, you know, the time I think for people to maybe, uh, well, it's either definitely not the time because nobody has extra money or it's definitely the time if you're experiencing the great pause. So if you can, and you can incorporate something, this is like that, you know, exit from quarantine thing where people are like, I am exiting from quarantine looking so much better because I've incorporated this tool. And you just look brighter, you have your boosted collagen, you look more contoured. I mean, I look completely different from the beginning of this video. It just brings, you know, and I haven't done it today, unfortunately. So now this is like my little treatment time. And you really, especially on the eyebrow, you get that height and you get, and you can what feel it. I love it. It looks like it's like a little higher on that side too, like a little yes. more of an arch. Oh, yeah. okay. That was amazing. Amazing. All right. So I want to talk and I may actually end up breaking this episode into two parts because I wanted to focus a little bit on the mother, your motherhood journey too. Um, you have really brought so many um, thoughts that I have had personally into words on your podcast, on your Instagram. And um, I want to hear about your motherhood journey. Kind of take us back to getting pregnant, trying to get pregnant and that whole experience. And, um, and we'll kind of walk through it because you're still in the first year too, which is a batshit year. So I want to hear about that. But I want to start from the beginning because um, I think a lot of women don't understand when you're trying to have, a, I didn't know this, when you're trying to have a family, you think all the craziness starts after you have the baby. But in fact, my feelings of insecurity and self-worth were being chipped away at when I was trying to get pregnant and I couldn't. Yeah. It was a short period, but it devastated me in every sense. So I wanted to know if you had a similar experience and talk us through from that point. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting if I'm, you know, my most honest, I wouldn't say that um, being a mother was something that I always knew that I wanted. Um, it was just kind of this like dull maybe. Um, and you know, you're a kid and you're like, yeah, of course you want kids. And then you get older and it's like, wait, am I supposed to be having kids now? And if so, why am I not feeling that pull, especially when this person and this person, this person are, is feeling it and they were like born to be a mother. And I just, I wanted to grow a business. I wanted to move to LA. I wanted to do all these other things. Plus I was married before and that marriage lasted 13 months. And so when you get divorced at 35, the timeline gets pushed. You know what I mean? Mostly in Los Angeles, you're like, okay, I'm 35 now. Now I need to find, now I need to find someone and then we need to have children. And then maybe that person, you know, hopefully they want children. Like you, I didn't think that I was going to get pregnancy because everything got pushed. And so, um, I met my husband, uh, you know, a year after my, you know, within the year of my divorce and he had also been divorced. And I think that both of us came into this relationship knowing exactly what we didn't want in a partner and knowing some of the things that were non-negotiable. And for me that, you know, and I think for, we both share in this, it was a compatibility and it was connection and it was laughter and it was friendship and, um, and so, you know, very quickly, we knew that we wanted children together, and I knew that he was going to be an amazing father and friend. And so um, we, you know, we tried before we were engaged, um, we got pregnant. Um, and unfortunately, we miscarried at about the eight week mark. Um, and, you know, I, you don't know how much you want something until you're confronted with having it. And, and I, I just, it was a whole new layer to our relationship. It was like, wow, you know, the idea of having a child brings this extra layer of love to my relationship with Micah, because it's like, now we get to do, now all of these things that I feel we're so rich in, we get to share that with a child and like, and, and have that be such a beautiful influence on another human. And, and we all get to do it together and learn and grow. And when we lost that baby, it was like, you know, I, I, I can't sit here and say that it was uh, uh, this period of extreme dev devastation. I think our doctor spoke a lot of sense into us very early on and was like, it's almost like a rite of passage. 
Um, I wish that more women spoke about miscarriage. I wish that more women spoke about how common it is to miscarry and how you can miscarry three, four, five times and then have three children. Um, it is not necessarily something that's wrong with you. It is, um, it is, I do sometimes, you know, I, I very much feel like it is a rite of passage that your body is, is, is creating a miracle. And sometimes, you know, your body senses, um, you know, genetic, uh, almost like malfunctions and sometimes will, um, send that spirit to another place so that you don't need to make that decision or it will send it to another place because it wasn't viable. And, you know, if I, if I learned anything and I learned a lot from pregnancy, it's to trust my body and that there is a plan and it's not maybe the plan that I thought it was going to be, but, you know, to, to just be kind and patient and, and alleviate uh, unnecessary stress if I can, and just hope for a better next time. And so, um, and so we uh, went through it again and um, about a year later and found out we were pregnant and, um, you know, it was the most eye-opening, joyful experience. I, again, <laughs> I feel like a lot of times coming into pregnancy, I didn't want to have a baby because most of the stories that you hear are the traumatic ones. You know, the people that had trauma during the birth of the child or almost died on the delivery table or um, miscarried at 25 weeks or, or some, you know, these types of things. And, and those stories, because those are the easier ones to relate to, or those are the ones that people feel more comfortable telling because they're not braggadocious because of how delicious their experience was like people don't share those stories out of sensitivity for the people that didn't have that experience and and that scared me from having a baby for mm -hmm. a long time I was like I'm gonna die on the delivery table that's just what's gonna happen or I'm gonna have a stillborn or I'm gonna have some, a genetic you know scenario when we have the genetic testing and it was like I just scared myself from having a child for many 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 years and then um, I got pregnant and, and this, and it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. It was a wonderful experience. And I do think it's worth saying once, you know, on the record that just because you hear about all of these nightmares, that doesn't increase your chances of having a nightmare, mm -hmm. you know, just because that's what you hear so much of that doesn't yeah. directly correlate to your luck. Well, it's interesting you say that because right now in this pandemic, we are also holding on to the negative experiences and stories that we're hearing around us. And that lesson is applicable in so many ways. I, like you, feel that if I consider every negative possibility, I somehow shield myself better from it. But it's yes. not the case. In fact, what you're doing is just putting this tremendous burden on your soul. So I... I like to know, I like to hear you say that, you know, and hear your sort of evolution out of that headspace. And you're right. I think the conversation about motherhood is so interesting. You, we all share our own experiences out of either um, feeling like we're trying to help someone or feeling like we just sort of need to purge it. How have you decided what to share and not share about motherhood? Because as you know, it's, it can be, um, a debate what is appropriate to share on the simplest of levels when it comes to social media. So how do you decide what version of motherhood you share publicly? Yeah, I think, you know, if people have been around for my story, it, there has been a dance of two. You know, I think people were around during my divorce. I wrote an article for Thoughtfully Magazine that was very candid and very open and didn't sugarcoat anything. And and so people have been around for divorce and then people were around for a, a, a marriage and people were in celebration of that. People were around for my miscarriage because I talked about it and then people were around for the birth. And so I think what I would like to share is that I think sometimes social media can just be a place of the highlight reel and I have really tried to show my wholeness. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about a pregnancy that was, um, you know, uh, a positive experience for me, people have history. Um, people know that it has come out of, uh, you know, a torrid marriage and it has come out of, you know, after miscarriage. And I think 
when you just share the highlight reel, it's so much easier to, to judge. And I think it's so much easier to not, to, to have confusion um, and to wonder uh, what other sides live with these people that look like everything's perfect or that, you know, they meet you, they, they talk about their experiences once they've already done all the hard work and you're not there for the hard work. And not to say that you, that anybody, that you owe that to anybody. I don't think that I owe my story to anybody. I don't owe, you know, we're in this place where it's, well, you share, you know, just share everything. And I don't think that that's the answer either. Like you have a personal life in real life and then you have this alternative reality on social media and so you can choose to share whatever you want but based on the reputation that you're going to have on that alternate media you you know should you should show i think a wholeness to you if you can it makes it more relatable it makes it more enjoyable it it's easier to um it's easier to commit to for me you know if i just was showing one note the entire time then that, that would be really sad that I wouldn't be able to connect with my, you know, my friends and my followers in a real way. I, it would only be upholding a certain vibe. And, 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 I, and I, I, I'm so happy that whatever it was that, that I felt comfortable with, I think I, the demographic of Skin Owl and the Off the Record podcast is one of vulnerability and mm -hmm. one of, I just want to relate to you. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think people want anything other than that from me personally. And so I just feel really lucky to have an audience that welcomes that and wants that and, and just wants to be real, not anything other. Yeah. I mean, I really didn't take, I've subscribed to your podcast, but it really didn't take listening to many episodes to feel that from you, which is commendable. And I joked in the beginning of the first episode about the, the um, episode where you talk about getting your period for the first time after having the baby. And I was like, that's me. Like, dude, like you're always, <laughs> you know, when you have no tampons left and you're like, holy shit, my body remembers that this is what it's supposed to do. Like what? I oh mean, yeah. Your, your candor and your, cause that's the type of people I love to surround myself with and who I think I am. And it's just so refreshing. And I, I really, I commend you on that because it's a difficult space, especially when you're sharing parts of your life to try to decide at what stage you let people in. Like you said, there are moments that, um, that maybe you need to heal first before you speak about it. There are other moments that right in the moment you have to share it. And, um, I just love it. I, I mean, everything that you've said about motherhood in, on your Instagram page as well. I think you put a post up recently right around Mother's Day where you talk about how we choose what to share about our journeys and how you try to take a step back and hear other people's stories before injecting your own. And I, I like that. Oh it's my God. Yeah. I mean, that's a big thing for me and that's a hard sensitive subject because, you know, <laughs> we as mothers are, it's, it's, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of layers there. I think sometimes motherhood can be clicky um, in, in positive ways and in not positive ways, especially um, to those who would love to be mothers. Um, I can imagine looking into this tribe of people. It is, um, it's annoying. Uh, it's annoying. Complex. When I was, when I was, some, wasn't able to get pregnant, I looked at moms and I was like, I hate you all. I mean, yeah, I'm going to be candid. I would, I remember just literally being like, oh my God, I just want to have a baby. Yeah. All you people are, you're talking about your kids. So yeah, it can be isolating to say the least. Yeah. You're annoying and, and you're indulgent and yeah. it, it absolutely can be. And so, um, and so if you have the, the gift and the miracle, literally the miracle of being a mother, I think, I think awareness is a wonderful thing to bring to the table where you should not stunt your own happiness and just relate to the people that can't have children. But I think you should lead with sensitivity. And I think that goes to, I think that can also lend itself to um, to people who are experiencing motherhood for the first time. You know, I wish that I could say, I got to tell my highs and, and share my wins and the things that I learned all by myself without looking at a YouTube video or without looking at a blogger that I had a, a platform and forum to always talk about that. But unfortunately, you know, and I get it, like if you're talking to another mother, they're remembering their times with, a, with an eight month old and they're you know, imparting their wisdom on you. And because, it, because the, the narrative is that if you're a new mom, you're tired and exhausted and you need help from all areas. And it really kind of goes away from 
the empowerment that you feel as a new mom and the, and the resourcefulness that you have as, a, as you know, like we didn't get a baby bottle uh, warmer. We got um, a thermos that like literally we would just put the bottle in the thermos, like almost like a swell type thermos and we put it and then the, I was like this is amazing like we didn't do the baby bottle warmer like we did this because of our resourcefulness and and it's like there's so much um innovation that goes into being a new mom that you want to share that and and I think that people should hold space for new moms to tell their story and to be active listeners um and let moms kind of have that shine um and then maybe relate the story back to yourself and share and and listen I mean that's just I think a hope uh, it's just like a plea for awareness if you are um a mother and you are and you have a friend who is a new mom to just like listen and let them share and and have and be so excited for them and how that could change the dynamic of that person's life um as opposed to thinking that everybody wants to um, relate the com you know hear someone relate the conversation back to them and and I and I I don't say that to be a, a dick I just say that to be you know honest and sensitive and I think that um, maybe more mothers new mothers would want that. <laughs> well, that being said, if someone were specifically asking you the biggest surprise or lesson of motherhood, especially in the early days what would you say? Something, it, it doesn't even have to be advice. It could be something that, like I said, was a shock to you after you had a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I think looking back, the two things, I think first, how much intuition plays a role in motherhood. I think we live in a world where people are sharing and there's hacks and there's, you know, use this to make life easier and, and, and employ this. And I think, um, you know, maybe the answer is not the rye method or maybe it's not eating from this spoon or, or this or that. Maybe it's just like to, to um, I learned this from my mommy and me teacher, but to wait, watch and wonder mm -hmm. and to just like look at your child and see the messages that they're sending you and your awareness and your intuitive response will then guide you. Um, and I, and I don't say that fluffy spiritual way. I say that in a very pragmatic, practical way. Like, you know, my, what I would have before getting pregnant, I would have liked to idealistically breastfeed until he was a year, of course. But did I only get to seven and a half months because he weaned himself off of my boob and wanted to start eating from a bottle more? Yeah. And so that's the way that it goes. You know, it's like, to not force everything that you have come to learn about what's normal and really just adopt to your normal. Like what is the best thing for your family? And um, I think intuition is sometimes left at the door that it's like, just love your child. You know what I mean? Like if your baby's crying and you want to pick him up and you don't want to do the cried out method, pick your baby up, yeah. you know, like love your child. And if we could just lead with love, like what effect uh, in terms of soothing and security would be um, reinstated in your child. And I think that's the first thing. And I think the second thing is how much um, time I think I needed after my birth. I think, or, you know, I agreed to having family come and, and support and stay, and it was done with the best intentions. But really what I needed was um, two to three weeks to be alone. Yeah. And to really learn what it was like and have systems with my husband before I could start hosting and committing to other people being in our space. And I think if I was to have another child, I would say, you know, why don't you guys come in like two or three weeks? Yeah. So get that your, was surprising. Get your routines in place and find out what it is you actually need. Yeah. And your hormones are all over the place. And like, you don't want to be like acting out in front of people and freaking out. It's like, you know, you're just, you're like a, you're, it's just a very impressionable time. <laughs> and so you just, I think for us, like Mike and I would have benefited from that type of um, hunkering down just as a couple. And then I think we would have been better people to be around. <laughs> yeah. I'm still not, if it makes you feel better, I, I'm still not a nice person to be around sometimes. <laughs> and my oldest is seven. My husband last week was just like, uh, I don't know sometimes who I married because the week before your period, you are demon spawn. And yes. the hormones, like oh, yeah. just, the hormones are just next level, which I feel like we could it's a, talk about. It's entirely. a dinosaur that they haven't yet, you know, discovered yet. 
<laughs> it's insane. Um, all that um, being said about um, sort of big lessons, practical products, podcasts, anything you like about um, anything products you like that made motherhood easier is what I'm trying to say. And it could be something as simple yeah. as like a passy that Monty likes or like, I don't know, anything that you can recommend that worked for you that people could check out. That's awesome question. It's so funny because Micah and I are always being like, this is awesome. And now let me think. I think um, uh, we we use the Snoo. Oh, yeah, um, I've heard about the Snoo. Is that the machine? Which, yeah, and like mm-hmm. at first glance, you're like, oh my God, just put the baby in a crib. Like we don't need all this technology. And I am on board with that. Like we do not, we're not an iPad family. We don't, you know, sit the kid in front of the television and have all the b- bells and whistles. Like we read, we use building blocks. Like this is, it's 1985 here in the Tevlin Golden Grand House. <laughs> but the snoo is the shit because it is, it mimics, you know, the movement in the womb and you get the white noise, which they love. And, um, and it's very e- easy to wean them off. Like you think like, oh my God, my baby's going to get addicted to the snoo. And then he or she is not going to be able to then thrive in a crib. And the weaning off process was really, um, really intuitive and really easy. And it's exactly like there's so much science into it that it's mm-hmm. like, it's all good. Like Monty is now sleeping in a crib 12 hours and was in a snoo for the first seven months of his life. Wow. Oh, that's so what I'm going to ask. Like I how really long did you use it? Seven months is a good well, amount of time to get out of that. They said to wean your kid off in five months and he had like a Kung Fu grip on that thing. Like he was not, again, going back to the intuition, like, yeah. well, the book says to cat off at five months. But for us, it was like, no, he mm-hmm. loves it and wants to stay in it. And you're encouraged to, your baby can stay in there until nine months if he or she wants. And so at about seven months, he started showing signs of like, I just don't want to be here anymore. And mm-hmm. I want my, I want to like spread out my legs and I want to turn over and all that stuff. And so um we he showed us he showed us he was ready for the crib and like didn't want to be in there anymore and so then we introduced the crib um and then he slept and it's like i i just wish that i had known more about that kind of stuff that like your baby even though he's like small and can't do a bunch of stuff he can show you signs yeah and that's really really cool yeah so dr carp is like a lifesaver i just the five s's are just yes and you can rent it like oh, for I didn't people that. that don't, yeah, if you don't want to spend the money, like you can rent it. You can rent it for like 65 bucks or something or 70 bucks a month. Oh, that's awesome. And you can introduce it and use it like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of what else. I think everything else is pretty, uh, you know, it's all like gradual, like things that he didn't like when he was a baby. He's now loving, like now he loves that whole Fawn Fawn, which is like the next generation of Sophie the Giraffe. And Oh. He loves the building blocks now. Um, he, oh my God, I have to show the, the swaddling. The, I'm, I'm going to make this really, we couldn't get down the swaddling. Like we, we did this and we <laughs> found the easy way to swaddle. And then our pediatrician showed us an even easier way to swaddle. And it just like wasn't working. And at Target, and I'm sure like you can get it anywhere, the Velcro swaddles oh, yeah. were the best. Just get those. Like, don't even do the swaddle. Don't like try and then the loop here and then the under the arm and all of that. Like, just get the Velcro swaddle from Target and then just do something else with the thirty extra minutes that you would have spent doing the swaddle. Yeah, that's like I never mastered the art form. Eventually, I just sat them down and just rolled it around them until yeah. it like and until I ran out of fabric. <laughs> I was like, now don't move. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going on forever, but I promise I only have a couple more questions. Let's talk specifically skincare during pregnancy. Um, obviously, there's ingredients we want to avoid. I want to know what products got you through and how your skin did, and any just general advice you could give to any expectant mamas out there for their skin. Absolutely. I think um, to keep it really uh, short and sweet, keep it simple. Keep it really simple. Your hormone cascade is all over the place. You're going to find that some of the products you were using and loving prior to pregnancy don't agree with you during pregnancy. Um, Maybe you can return to them after pregnancy, but even so, let's say you're able to keep your entire routine that you were using pre-pregnancy during pregnancy, you might not be able to use it while you're breastfeeding. So, you know, have some um, expectation management there that like the things that you've always loved and always kept your skin glowing might not be the case during pregnancy. 
Um, keep it really simple, you know, stay obviously away from the retinols, stay away from the peels, stay away from anything that could exacerbate in any way. I love pure plant oils. Um, I used a lot of products that were um, going to keep me really hydrated and moist because uh, I was very dehydrated during my pregnancy. Um, so our Mackie Berry Whip, I literally use because of the botanical hyaluronic acid morning, night, all the time, just to get that like nice plump quench. Um, I used our body oil all over my body every single night, straight out of the shower. And I have zero stretch marks. I just, I, that is like one feat in itself because before getting pregnant, people were like, I used your body oil literally every day and I have no stretch marks. And I was like, that's cool for them, but I'm, like somebody could sneeze on my skin and I would have a mark. So I'm like, well, that's cool for them, but that's not, and then I used it myself and I was like, shit, that's awesome. So <laughs> I used our body oil, totally unscented. Um, that's also something I would recommend, like stay away yeah. from highly for your sense of smell might be a little different so you lived before might not be as attractive um, when you're pregnant and just keep it really you know just simple and easy um, a nice quenching serum with botanical hyaluronic acid um, you know vitamin E um, antioxidants um, uh, and, and like a nice face oil at night that you can rub down your neck, onto your breast, down your stomach, down your legs. Like it's all about moisture. Um, <clears throat> what else I used? I love the, um, they called, they're the butt masks. Do you know oh, what I'm but, talking about? Oh my God. I, I don't heard right someone, now. um, if, one other podcast talk about them, like Natch Butte maybe mentioned them. Like they go on your butt? It, <laughs> yes. So they're like, they're like two little, it's one for each cheek. And I get them from Credo. Um, and they have oh. like a brightening one. They have a lifting one. They have whatever. Oh my gosh, and it's just, that's amazing. It's just so cute to just like kind of check in with different areas of your body that you can't see. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer and so, just not to look at parts that I can't see that's, sometimes. That's just like. Yeah. Mm. It just like gives you a little bit of like morale. Like, okay, well. I haven't totally forgotten about my butt. And That's so cute. you put, they're like little like sheet masks and you can put them on. I think they're actually, they might even be biodegradable, but I get them from Credo and they're awesome. Okay. Um, and I use them during my pregnancy. Um, and I just use like a natural clear nail polish. Like I kept things really simple with my nails just because the, the, um, the, uh, what are they called? The, I use the ritual prenatals while oh, yeah. I was pregnant beforehand and during and my nails were like wow like oh my gosh grew so long so the clear nail polish is just like a na nail strengthener right I just kept it really simple and like not super smelly and just really moisturizing and nourishing and you know tinted moisturizers instead of foundations lip glosses like creamy cheek blushes as opposed to powders like all of that kind of stuff was the name of the game I love it. Oh my gosh. So much good information. Um, before we go, tell us what Skin Owl is up to. Any good, like, tell us where to find you, any good promos you're running so people can go check it out and maybe a good starter product too, if people um, want to try out the line and kind of see what it's about. I love that. I say our hero products for Skin Owl are eye balm, um, our brightening eye balm. It's just called Eye. It's in a pump. It's delicious. You can use it morning and night. Um, if you want a good gateway product that's going to want, that's going to send you into wanting more, I would definitely try one of our drops. Um, these are um, just face oils for morning and night. There's lavender, there's geranium, there's clary sage. Um, they're all for different skin concerns. So you can check that out on skinowl.com. And then our Mackie Berry Whip. Um, you mix it into any of our drops. If you're at, if you're like a dew queen where you're like you're always looking for the dew and the glisten and the glimmer on the cheek and the forehead and down the nose and all of that like just use the mackie berry whip just like don't just run just do it just try it you'll see what i'm talking about um and yeah we just redesigned our packaging for the first time in seven years so um this is an amazing time to try skin owl because it's colorful and it's bright and it's sustainable and you can recycle it and it's like you know, I think it's just a cheery note on your vanity. 
um, and we make everything by hand and hand label, hand bottle. I mean, everything is done with so much love and um, so definitely try Skin Owl. I mean, we can use, a, I can share a discount code if you want for your people. I you would love that. Just- yeah. Send, uh, yeah. Don't you, I'll include it in show notes guys. So just check it out there, but that'd be awesome because I think that'll help people, you know, take the plunge. Maybe we'll just call it sunny. I like that. I love that. I like it. I know. It's like your name. Okay. I'm super into that. So then we'll know like where people came from. Just S O N N I. S O N N I. um, It'll give you 15% off everything on skinowl.com. If you guys want to try it, you can always follow us on Instagram at Mm -hmm. skinowl. I'm behind the skin, the Instagram account. So if you guys have questions about your skin or you don't know where to start, you can totally hit us up through DM and I'll connect with you there. And listen to off the record with, um, with Andy and sometimes Micah. He, he guests once, once in a while. Um, you guys have such a good vibe. I love it. I, I, it's good. It's good stuff and it's real. Gosh, we need more of that. We need less aspirational, more relatable. This is just one girl. Yes. So Annie, thank yes. you so much for letting me like bother you about this interview for so long. And um, thank you for like sharing your wisdom with us. It was so fun. Oh my God. Well, thank you for your patience and thank you for everything that you do. You are such a natural and such a pro and I'm so honored to be here. And um, yeah, I just wish you the best. Stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we can connect once we all hang out again. We'll be neighbors in Montana or Idaho one day, maybe. (laughs) Far, far away. Um, All right, girl. Take care. Take care. Enjoy that little baby. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.